Hello Saddlers fans and welcome back to the Warsaw Rewind. This time round we're recapping the busy month of January both on and off the pitch here at Warsaw Football Club. I'm joined as always by my colleague Paul Joanno and later on in the show we'll have an exclusive chat with co-chairman Ben Boycott about all things at the club including the busy January transfer window which saw the Saddlers sign five players. There was three new contracts in there as well in the build up to January and in January and we also saw five outgoings there as well. Alongside that chat about the January transfer window we will also talk to Ben about the opening of the locker. We obviously had two test events before the main launch so we'll talk to him about all things in regards to that. But with that, Paul, we'll get straight into the games. There was four games played across two different competitions. And what a way to start the brand new year. Then a trip up to Grimsby, which we were dreading because of, well, it's a long trip. But what a performance. It's all right, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, obviously it was the first game since that fantastic performance. Well, two performances against Crew and Wrexham here at the Pound and Beskett Stadium. Um, so I think there was always that sense of, after the Lord Mayor show, there was always that little bit of worry that, you know, you have such a high against Wrexham and, you know, it's such an energy sapping performance. Is there going to be a, a bit of a drop off or can you find those levels again? And, and my God, did the Saddlers manage to do that? I mean, it didn't start particularly great. Um, it was a bit of a slow start to the game, obviously falling behind. But I think as soon as the Saddlers did fall behind, I think they regrouped like, I think in every away win, every, Saddles have fallen behind, haven't they? So they've, they've managed to find a way to regroup, um, get the equaliser, and then from there it was it was just a, an obliteration, wasn't it? Um, fantastic first goal, wasn't it, from Douglas James Taylor? Um, every I think everyone in the ground thought he was going to be um, second favourite to get to that ball, get to that ball, and I think it's Danny Johnson in the box who um, is screaming for it and. Instead of squaring it across, him, Douglas just lashes it in, and that's what got the Saddlers underway. Two from Isaac Hutchinson, who, you know, has really found his scoring form this season, and then for you know Jack Eary making it two and two, special for him, and Priestley Farkas and getting his first goal, it, and then obviously Danny Johnson rounded it all off. It was just, it was just a perfect day, wasn't it? In the end, it was. I think the only thing that we found that wasn't perfect on was the, the lack of fish and chips being uh, available to us after the performance, but. Like you say, it was one of those where I actually don't think that there was... It, I don't think it was our best performance of the season, you know, but it was one of those where if you ask for a clinical edge on the road, it was exactly that. And I think the Douglas James Taylor one, the pressing from the front foot to then go and win the ball back so high up. And like you say, it was second favourite to, to get the ball, but a fantastic finish from him. And I think the stat that you pulled out on the day was that he'd started... The 2023 with a goal on New Year's Day as well, starts 2024 with a goal. It seems to like that tradition of, of bagging on the opening day of the, the brand new calendar year. Yeah, it does. It was against Mansfield, wasn't it, in 2023? And he's, he's continued that. That Again, that was his second goal of the season. We've Coincidentally, his first goal of both, the last two seasons have both come in November as well. I think both in the FA Cup as well. <laughs> so uh, a few patterns there with Douglas. Uh, but you know, going back to the performance, you know, you say it wasn't, you don't think it was actually Walsall's best performance. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd agree. I think a more complete performance was the Wrexham game, wasn't it? For example, and the Crew game. They were more complete performances. But I think what you saw at Grimsby was that has been ruthless and capitalising on Grimsby. Going away from home, tough place to go. Grimsby always is with the weather and the, the ground and the crowd there. And, you know, they're, they're, they're fighting and scrapping. I think they've re Well, I think Artel had been in situ for about a month or so, but still... They've got a new manager, so they've got fresh ideas now, haven't they? So it was always a tough challenge, but I think what that performance was about was about the Saddlers capitalising on Grimsby errors and being absolutely ruthless. And, and my God, we were also ruthless. We were brilliant. And then that was a fantastic day, fantastic occasion. And then you go to the next weekend and it's another fantastic day. It's an experience that I don't think we'll ever forget from a media point of view. It's certainly not the ground you're going to get to go to every day and it's Southampton in the FA Cup and albeit you know Southampton won 4-0 but I think at the time of recording they're now 24 games unbeaten their last loss came I think it was the 23rd of September which is an unbelievable feat Russell Martin ex Warsaw as well you know albeit he was only here for you know a couple of months or so but he's got them really ticking and you could just see on the day the quality difference couldn't you 
if Southampton are not a Premier League side come what the end of the season I will be flabbergasted they are a fantastic team you, I mean I know we, we played Leicester in the FA Cup last season when they were a Premier League side Blackburn Rovers earlier in the season well, they looked a good championship side but Southampton kind of blew me away with their quality to be honest but Ryan Fraser was was a joke on the day um, you know really really terrific look little player causes all sorts of problems not only with the ball but with his off the ball running as well and, and that's going to happen with the well, let's be honest they've got a lot of Premier League quality mm -hmm. it's a, we essentially went to a Premier League ground in the Championship didn't we it was it was a great occasion you know I think oh, the highlight for me was the over was it 2300 odd Sanders mm -hmm. fans did not stop singing all, all, all day I think they all had a brilliant day and it, it was the game of what could have been though wasn't it mm -hmm. because Go one nil down really early, early doors, and I was really impressed with how the Sadlers didn't crumble them because Southampton would continue to apply pressure. But they, you know, we really dug deep. We really found something and got got a bit of a foothold in the game. Started to slowly venture forward, and then I think had a couple of chances at the end of the first half. But then two big chances at the start of the second half. Tom Knowles put him on over the bar, and, and Jack Earing in a great position just kind of fluffed his lines with his finished in there. You know, it looked. I really thought we were going to equalise at that point, but it just wasn't quite to be. And then obviously Southampton, they sort of rediscovered their, their form, find that second gear. And I think once they got the second goal, it kind of knocked the stuff in a bit out of us. And, you know, for all our effort and endeavour, the, the quality shone through. And, you know, the, the players that Russell can bring off the bench, you know, was it Che Adams as well yeah. coming on? Like, yeah, it, it ended up um, just going away from us on the day. But when you look at what they've done, since that 4 0 starts looking a little bit better and better, doesn't it? But a great day, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, fantastic experience, and thank you to everyone at Southampton for uh, looking after us. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the media guys from our point of view were absolutely brilliant on the day, so thank you to those guys who you know gave us a, a guided tour of, of everything behind the scenes. It was great to see how almost how the other half live effectively <laughs> because. You know the the facilities there was something that we're not perhaps used to, but you and know, the beef stew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the food was very yeah, good very as well. Good. But you know, we're not necessarily used to seeing that side of the game, are we? It was a completely different perspective for us, and I hope everybody who also went down on the day, you know, had a fantastic time. Um, it was great to see the uh, minutes applause in the 46th minute for Mark Rayner as well. Um, I know that was something that you know really touched a lot of people. Uh, that travelled on the day it would have touched a lot of people in the, the wider Warsaw community as well. I think we want to say a massive thank you to Ray Gray Snacks as well, who sponsored the sleeve for that game. That was, you know, a massive thing for us as well. So thank you very much to them. And like I say, it was just a, a fantastic day all round. And as tough games go, then you go from a tough game in the FA Cup to a tough game in the league. You go away to top of the league in Stockport, who going into it, they just perhaps faltered a little bit, not to take anything away from them because they're there on merit and they showed it, didn't they? I think for you know large spells of that game, they showed why they're top of the league. And, you know, albeit Akil's right goal came from, you know, distance. It was one of those, it was a good strike by him. And then, you know, you get yourself back on level terms just two minutes later through Douglas James Taylor. But overall, I think their quality shone through, didn't it, on the day? Yeah, I was surprised they didn't get the job done last season, Stockport in the playoffs, obviously losing to Carlisle um, in the final at Wembley. Um, so, you know, narrowly missed out last season. So I think it was always inevitable they were going to go again and come back stronger with the quality they've got and the quality they've added as well. I mean, I know they actually had quite a lot of injuries that day, didn't they? But they were still able to bring you know, the likes of Nick Powell off the bench as well. I mean, at League Two level, that, that, you know, that's fantastic armoury to have. And as you say, I think there was not a lot in it until the, the first goal that sort of sparked it into life it, well it was added time in the first half really and then gets that goal from distance which quite disappointing but then the reaction from the from the side was fantastic you know we get back on level terms almost instantly brilliant header from Douglas James Taylor made it goals in back to back games his third third of the season and you know continued his sort of form from um, from getting that goal at Grimsby and it was one of them again I think it was a on a bit of on the knife edge second half and then Stockport get that goal, it was the free kick, wasn't it? Sort of directly goes in, you know, did he actually mean it? Sort of, sort of hit the bar, doesn't it? And then Tanto Alafe just, just taps it in. So it was a bit of a really frustrating one to concede from a set piece situation. And then what that did was it lifted that crowd. 
and it became really difficult because they had the tails up the crowd were really vociferous you know that big stand behind the goal it reminds me of Tranmere's you know when that gets going it's, it's really loud and you can you can almost feel the ground shake and I think Stockport got something from that they sort of really built from that and then applied more pressure and then win the penalty and then I think from there it's uh, it became a difficult task for the Saddlers really at, at 3-1 I think Stockport with, with about 12 minutes to go, you, I think you could sense that Stockport were going to go and see that one out. Had it lasted 2-1, another 5-10 minutes, and Sadler's went into the 5-10 minutes, just a goal behind, I think the mood of the crowd is different, isn't it? And then it just starts to quieten down, and that's when the Sadler's can you know, really find something. But it wasn't quite to be, and, and we just uh, just fell on the wrong side of it that day, didn't we? We did, and... You know, going back to Southampton, you, you brought up the food option at Southampton, and we all, we I think I remember in the first rewind we were talking about food, and we'd been to we mentioned Bradford at one point yeah. as well. The food option there was fantastic. It seems like all we care about is food at the moment, but the food option at Stockport was very good as well. Peri peri chicken and and rice, so fantastic option to have there. And oh, you know, brilliant. it, it right was. I, I don't know whether it's quite top in Bradford yet, but yet. Uh, you know that was a very good. Shout out very good option for that one we would have had a fifth game in the month obviously but that got called off so then we go right to the end of the month the 27th of January we welcome Sutton to the Poundland Bescott Stadium and again not a game of great quality overall but on the day a draw sort of felt like the fair result from it I think both sides sort of cancelled each other out and to get the Saddlers going, Donovan Daniels pops up with his first goal at the Poundland Bescott Stadium. What a goal it was. Not bad, was it? Uh, lovely little flick by uh, Jack Earring as well, I think it was. Mm. Um, and then shift it past, shifts it past one defender and then just unleashes a, a terrific strike into the, into the top bins. And you know, Not a bad way to score your first goal at the Poundland Bescott Stadium. I think just over two years after he signed, give or take a week. So by the time he got one at home, I'm sure he's... Uh, Delighted about that, and um, yeah, Sutton sort of equalised not too long after. Did they through Craig Easley? I think that one took a deflection, but I think you're right. I think um, a draw was fair on the day, and I think in the second half it did get a bit scrappy, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of fouls, very stop start. Um, at times, I think there was times where both teams may have had a foul, but they had the advantage, but then the referee would still pull it back. So it just, I don't think it quite got going, and I, I have to. Give a shout out to Sutton. I think they're quite a robust side and they're good at what they do. And you know, Steve Morris has come in there trying to change a few things as well. And in the obviously, we don't want to speak too much about the one earlier in the season, but you know they they did a job on us on that that day, and you could see they were playing to their strengths. And then I thought when they came here, they they looked a solid outfit. And um, based on the two games I've seen from them, I'm quite surprised to see them in that bottom two. And and you know, I wouldn't be too surprised if they they do manage to get a few more results and they maybe can get themselves back into contention and, and perhaps stay up because I think they'd had a few good draws before against the like Barrow, Mansfield, so they they've been competitive against good teams in this division. They just can't quite get over the line by the look of it. So I actually think they're a decent side. So point not the result we wanted, but again I think it was important that we sort of didn't start a run of defeats because I think it was obviously Southampton and um, Stockport, so it was important that you know, we at least got something, and we did. If you can't, I think Matt, Matt Sadler said this, if you can't win the game, don't lose the game, and that's what happened. Yeah, I was about to say exactly the same thing. You took the words right out of my mouth there, and it is about one of those times where if you can't find a way to win the game, certainly don't find a way to lose it, and it's a point in the right direction. Like you say, it sort of stopped that little bit of a panic in regards to, well, we've lost two games, albeit against two very good, you know, opposition teams, you know, they were fantastic, Stockport and Southampton. Sutton, like you say, were robust and I think we discussed it on the day, very surprised that they are where they are. They are good at what they do. Obviously, they've done a number on us earlier on in the season, but, you know, that it, Steve Morrison's doing a decent job there, isn't he? Yeah, he is and I think, obviously, in the games that have followed, I don't think they've done too badly either, so... Uh, still a long way to go, a lot of football to be played and it's interesting to see that obviously Sutton and Forest Green both made managerial changes, so, um, well Forest Green have made a, have made a couple, but um, Steve Cox has gone in there, so it'll be interesting to see the dynamic at the bottom of the table, but 
I think Matt Sadler says there's no gimmies in this in this division. There really there really isn't. Um, you know, it's a highly competitive division. There's after the January window where teams have, have strengthened and, and added to their squads. I think one of the loan signings for Sutton, I can't remember his name, more than number, number 50 shirt, but he looked, he looked brilliant on the left wing on loan from QPR. So you never know what what these signings are, how they're going to impact their teams. But I think it's also worth mentioning, I think Matt Sadler also alluded to this in the post-match interview after the Sutton game. Um, he said it kind of looked like we'd had a two-week break because of the postponement with Accrington. So obviously... I think that week was very disruptive in terms of cause the team were training in different places due to the, the ice that day and having to find um, alternative venues because uh, the frozen pitch at Essington. So it's quite a disruptive week, albeit they prepared as well as they possibly could. And then when you don't have that game and you lose that sort of match intensity for a couple of weeks, I think it took, took the team a while to sort of get that back. And I think Matt alludes to the fact that, yeah, it, it did look like we'd, um, we'd had a bit of a break. So. Um, like we said, we didn't lose the game, so take that point and move on. Yeah, we've recapped those four games now. So, Paul, from that, who would be your player of the month for January? I might, you might say this might be a bit left field, but I, I think David had. Well, you know, I think he's grown so much in a Sadler shirt. I think back end of December, we saw in that back three with Donovan and Priestley, they've built a really good relationship between them, and he had a hand in that goal. Uh, for Taylor Allen, I think it was, but I think in January he's gone, he's gone from strength to strength, hasn't he? And, you know, really cemented his place. You know, Emmanuel Adeboyega's come in to add even more competition, so you wondered, oh, is Manny going to come in or is Dave going to keep playing? But Dave's been fantastic, and I think he's really grown, not just as a player, but as a person around the club as well. Um, so I've been really impressed with Dave, so I, I might go with Dave. You know, people may disagree with me, but I, I've just been really impressed with Dave. Yeah, I think you you know pretty spot on there in regards to the way that he's grown as a person away f- from it all at the training ground. He seems to have come out of his character a little bit. You know, he's done a little bit more with us. You know, he just seems to be somebody who's growing a little bit more. And he is. I think that the run of games that he's had has has really helped him. And we've spoken about it before with the fact that Priestley come back in, and it just allowed Donovan to shine. You know, on his own, he's been able to step in to midfield almost at times. But it's also probably helped Dave as well, hasn't it? Because it, for him, he's now he looks confident. He looks, he, you know, much more at ease on the ball. He wants to almost try and mimic what Donovan's doing, but on the other side of it. So I think, you know, I would have to agree with you there that Dave has really come into his own in January. And I think I'm I'm going to go with you there on that one for, for Player of the Month. Let us know in the comments section who your Player of the Month would be for January. And speaking of moments in the month, we'll go into our goal of the month before we get into talking about, you know, other things. But what would yours be? I think it's a toss-up between Doug's James Taylor's at Grimsby and Donovan's against Sutton. It's one of them two, I think. I think it's the build-up with Douglas's, isn't it, with um, how he's second favourite for the ball by a mile and somehow gets to it, brilliant touch pass, and then lashes it in. Whereas Donovan, we've got to remember, he's a centre-half as well. Um, and it was a centre-forward finish, you know, shifted it past his man and then finds the top corner. It was a fantastic finish. So it's a toss-up between them two. So... I'm sure Sadler's fans will have their say as well, so maybe you can make the decision for me on that one. Yeah, I think I would go with Donovan's, and I think he was uh, the, my biggest disappointment on the day was I don't think it featured in the AFL's top five goals of the weekend, which, I mean, there must have been some unbelievable goals scored that weekend, but for me, I'm going for Donovan because, like you say, he's a centre half. He's been in those sorts of positions before, and we've said that in the press box just shoot. And he, he never does, he never pulls the trigger on that at that point. But he did on that day and, you know, sometimes that, you know, it's that age old thing if you don't buy a ticket, you, you're not going to win the, you know, not going to win the raffle. So he did on that day and scored a fantastic goal. Uh, you've heard our goal of the month, but now it's your turn to choose your goal of the month. Though they're on our official Twitter channel. Uh, goal of the month is brought to you in association with the Yellow Ribbon Podcast. It's a topical show, and recently they spoke to former Sadlers defender Jim O'Connor. It was a bumper episode which included discussions about his goal against Chelsea, the playoffs, and missing that Wembley game. Uh, the episode is now available to listen to over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, we will pick four goals from the month of January, so make sure you head over to our Twitter page just after this has gone out to make sure you vote for your favourite. 
Elsewhere at the football club, the conference and events department have started the year off incredibly strong, um, following the success of their first ever Bingo Loco last year in October. The team have just held their second, which was an even bigger event, and it was a bigger success as well. And there are four already booked in for the remainder of 2024. Also in the conference and events department, after the uptake of the Christmas with the players evening, we'll be hosting an Easter evening with the players again. That is scheduled in for Thursday, the 4th of April, with more details on that one coming soon. For more information on all of our upcoming events, make sure you head over to WFC, the venue, and you'll find all the information there. In the commercial department, it's great to see that all of our players have now been sponsored. Uh, they've all been sold for the current season and we extend all of our thanks over to all of the businesses who have sponsored the squad for the year. Uh, it was also announced last month in January that we'll be holding our annual golf day on Wednesday the 10th of April at Calderfields Golf and Country Club. Uh, the golf day will include a host of first team players because there's quite a lot of them who do enjoy a round of golf. Uh, there will be some club legends and some of the management there as well. There are various sponsorship opportunities available for this one, so please get in touch with our commercial team and Adam and Kira will be able to assist you further. All contact details for the both of them can be found on our official website. Uh, elsewhere, you know, we've seen as part of the fantastic work done over the Christmas period, we were able to donate an incredible amount of food and other items to the Blockswich and Blake North Food Bank, as well as the Warsaw North Food Bank. Head coach Matt Sadler, Captain Donovan Daniels, Priestley Farkson, Joe Riley, Jamil Matt and Harry Williams were all on hand uh, to donate the goods and we would like to again extend our thanks to principal partners Poundland for the generous donations that they made. They made lots of donations for that and that was absolutely fantastic. As well as the supporters and staff at the club who also kindly donated. Uh, just a note on that one, we'll be making a further donation to the food banks in the summer. We spoke to the guys there and they notified us that you know the summertime is something that people don't necessarily think about in regards to food banks. So they wanted to, us to you know extend if we could to go in into the summer and we'll be certainly doing that. So when we have more information on those dates that we'll be making donations, we will let you know. Finally, from a commercial standpoint, we'd like to thank Ray Gray Snacks for being our sleeve and back of short sponsors for the FA Cup, as I mentioned earlier on, um, for the game against uh, Championship side Southampton. And we would also like to say a massive thank you to National Car Finder for being the back of short sponsors for Warsaw Women. Uh, on a final note from things elsewhere at the football club, uh, there is currently a huge mid-season sale going on in the club shop, both online and in store with up to 60% off all array of items. If you shop online, get yourself an extra 10% off using code WARSAL10. That's everything covered off in regards to other departments at the football club, and we're going to be joined shortly by co-chairman Ben Boycott. Paul will be talking to him all about you know, January, the transfer window going on, and it will be really interesting to see you know, dive a little bit deeper into those sorts of things in regards to those that have come in. And I think the one that will be particularly interesting from our standpoint and, and any football fan standpoint is the transfer of Evan Weir. Obviously, he came from Drada, our sister club. And you don't get many of those transfers further down the pyramid. You get them, you know, in the Premier League. I think we spoke about, you know, the likes of Manchester City and Nottingham Forest as well. But there's not many teams at our level who've got a sister club. Um, so it'd be really interesting to hear from his point of view what goes on with those sorts of transfers, you know, and then we'll talk to him about how Traveller have invested in Matt Sadler in the transfer window with contract extensions, bringing loan players in as well. And then we'll also, like we say, cover off the opening of the locker, which has been absolutely fantastic. And we hope that Sadler's fans who've been into the locker have seen the feedback that was given to us and, you know, hopefully the changes that have been made to make sure that it's a more enjoyable experience. I think the opening was against... Uh, um, Sutton, sorry, and it was one of those where hopefully those that have been in for the test events could see the changes. Um, but on that note, we're now going to be joined by co-chairman Ben Boycott and he will you know, divulge into the January transfer window and into the opening of the locker. Um, on that, here we are. Well, Ben, thank you very much for joining us on the January Warsaw Rewind. We'll jump straight into things as we are in the locker. We held two test events here against Crewe and Wrexham before mm -hmm. the full launch of opening the locker. Why was it so important to have those test events? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a really significant renovation, right? It's a, a big operation here. I think the facility has been shut down since 2018, and so it's no small thing to get it reopened and get the get the heaters working and, and uh, make sure all the tills are working and, and all that sort of thing. So uh, when we opened it properly, we wanted it to be right and know that everything was going to work properly. And so, yeah, I think it was smart of the team to say, well, let's, let's kind of ease into it with these limited events. And, and about another big bit of that, too, is really wanted to gather feedback from the supporters who were at those events, because um, ultimately this is for our supporters. And so we want to really hear their, their feedback on what needed to be different. Got some great feedback and uh, made some changes uh, off of what they said and, and uh, hit the ground running, I think, when we uh, opened it uh, for good. I was going to say, it's one of those where it's not necessarily something that's going to be the finished product immediately. Mm -hmm. So having the supporter feedback was key, wasn't it, to make those small changes here in the locker? For sure. And um, I, I don't think it's a finished product now. I think we'll continue to, to refine it as, as we go along and just uh, yeah, can continue to gather feedback and, uh, and make it hopefully better every time somebody walks in the front door. Yeah, we've sort of seen the progress from the test events to the match day and obviously the Sutton game is brilliant, it's really busy here. Yeah. Um, also around the match day, obviously there's plans to sort of hopefully have it used more during the week. So what, what's yeah. sort of the vision for the locker outside of match day as well in your eyes? Yeah, well match day is, is the main thing, right? Um, and so that's, that's one of the first things that when, when we came in in 2022, it was just really obvious this building just we felt had so much potential, uh, really unused potential and really an, an eyesore on the site uh, at the time uh, and wanted to turn into what, what I think it is now, which is a, a great way to enhance the experience for all of us together on, on a match day. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think throughout the week we're, we're really going to work hard and, and that's another one of those where we'll gather feedback and, and we'll, we'll kind of ease our way into it and I think we're still learning what we have with the facility. But uh, yeah, I mean, on select nights throughout the week, uh, we'll look to uh, have other uh, sporting events shown on the televisions and, and potentially live events, live music, uh, just all sorts of different things that, that could happen in here. And, and we'll, we'll try a bunch of stuff and, and we'll see what works. And, and what, with the, the goal to be to just continue to bring the community together around the club, provide a gathering place uh, for, for our supporters and for our, our broader town to, to share uh, great drink and great experiences. Yeah, that's it. Is that what is the most exciting thing about the locker? Like, like Tom alluded to, it's, it's not the finished article. I guess it's like when you move house as well, and then as the years go by, you, you put your decorations in and you make <laughs> it more homey. Is, is it that potential of this venue that really excites you and should excite, excite not just water fans, but the town as well? I think so. I mean, look, on the renovation itself, I think the team has done a really good job. Uh, the before and af after pictures are, are really remarkable and uh, as you guys know I mean my my what I believe the football club is is something to uh, take the town forward and, and be something for the town and all of us together to gather around and this is just another way to do that obviously uh, three o'clock on a Saturday is is the main one but uh, and that's the most important thing but as we grow around that as well what other experiences can we provide to continue to, to build community and, and draw the town together and, and give something back and, and serve the community in that way Elsewhere in January, obviously the main focus that supporters will look at is the January transfer window and I think a good place to start with that was a little bit before it in regards to contract extensions. Trevella coming into the, the transfer window said they would back head coach Matt Sadler and they have in many a way and contract extensions is one that perhaps won't be seen as new players coming in but it's another form of backing for the, manager, uh, for the head coach and Matt himself has said that you know, it's about building for the future. And we saw Oshin McKenzie just prior to yeah. uh, December signing a, a contract, uh, Jack Earing signing a yep. new contract, and then Liam Gordon as well. How important is it that that is what is happening, that we are building for the future? Very important. Uh, and uh, that's what we're, I hope we can do in each successive window, uh, is to continue to build for the future. Um, and that was the goal this window, was to build for the future and to recognize that the next 18 games matter a whole lot. And so we've done things this window uh, that are very geared towards the next 18 games. And we've done things in this window that are very geared towards the next several years. So I think the contract, contract extensions are, are great. I was really pleased to get those three over the line, uh, each of the players you just mentioned. Um, and yeah, they've all been massive contributors this season. And so I'm glad they'll be with us next season as well. That's, that's really significant.
It's an eye on the future as well, isn't it? You know, Matt has said it on a number of times. It's about having a foundation to build off. And with the players that are currently under contract at the football club going into you know, next season already, there is that foundation that's pretty solid at the moment. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I think my first summer here we signed 19 new players. Don't exactly know the number off the top of my head for last summer, you guys might, but it was, it was, it was, a, 19, yeah. it was a big number again, right? Uh, which is fine in a sense, but I think really tough to be successful with, with turnover in both managerial staff and in players. You just never really have that settled squad when you're turning over so much. And so if I look at the players that we have under contract for next season, I think we have a really good good core, and that's by design. That takes several windows to build, but um, yeah, I, I like the core. We'll, we'll aim to strengthen again uh, in the summer and just hopefully go from strength to strength uh, with, with continuing to build uh, each window. You mentioned about strengthening the summer. There'll, all, there'll already be a new face in the summer in Evan Weir, won't they? Obviously, I think he signed um, between Christmas and New Year around the same time Jack Earing signed his new contract. And obviously, he's someone Trevella will know well with obviously the, the links with Drada and you know, Tr- Drada being under the Trevella umbrella. It, it's not something we've seen a lot in the lower leagues. I know we've, you know, Manchester City, for example, have something similar with their model with Girona and things like that, Nottingham mm-hmm. Forest and Olympiacos, but it's not something you see in the lower league. So, mm-hmm. can you shed any more light on how those sort of relationships work and you know, yeah. how exciting it is as well for, for Warsaw and obviously? How excited should Warsaw fans be about Evan coming as well? Yeah, Evan's a great player. Uh, he's done really well for Drahada in the last uh, several years. Um, and, you know, that, that was a, a really good situation that illustrates what we're trying to do uh, between between Walsall and Drahada. I mean, both are fantastic clubs, and the League of Ireland is, is growing a lot. The League of Ireland uh, Premier Division is a, is a great league, and you look at some of the players that we have in the squad right now, not including Evan. I mean, obviously, Freddie Draper was here. Uh, Manny uh, was in Drahada before. Ross Tierney was there. Osh was there. And so it's, it, it is a, a real um, a real great talent market. Um, and it's a great league in its own right as well. And so I think uh, what we're trying to, to build is a scenario where that relationship is really positive for both clubs, where it's benefiting Drada in their season uh, because they're either able to retain players that they may not have otherwise or uh, potentially situations where, where players are there on loan. And then, yeah, of course, as a, as a talent pathway, it'll, it'll be great for uh, Walsall as well. Um, and so Evan Weir is a great example of that. That was really beneficial for both clubs. So uh, Evan had seen his contract expire uh, at the end of Drahada's last season uh, in November and had done really, really well. And so he had some big clubs in Ireland, um, some of the biggest clubs in Ireland were looking to secure Evan's services for this season we're coming into. Um, but obviously Evan had a desire to sign with an English club and we were able to, to offer that to him so we could obviously uh, secure the services of a really talented player, um, but also Drada was able to retain him for the first bit of that season, uh, which would have been difficult um, without this sign and loan back situation. So that's a situation where uh, I think both supporter bases can, can look at that and say, yeah, this this relationship between the two clubs uh, was really good for us. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Evan in his uh, Drada shirt in the next few months and uh, and him building towards uh, um, coming over here. You mentioned Freddie Draper there. Obviously, we've seen him go back to his parent club alongside Harvey Griffiths right at the start of the January. The, the club mm-hmm. further strengthened the group then by bringing in the signs of Manny Adeboyega, as you've already mentioned, Josh mm-hmm. Gordon and Mo Fowl coming in. How important was it, first of all, to replace Freddie, but replace him with players who clearly know the division well in Josh, who had a fantastic year with yep. Barrow last year, and Mo, who's had a good start to the season previous, at his previous club, Doncaster? Yep. So, yeah... Um, Freddie was a, a significant loss. None of us enjoyed seeing that. Uh, obviously, it was meant to be a full season loan, but uh, the combination of how well he had done here and some of the injuries they were facing at, at Lincoln City, it didn't work out that way, right? So, uh, so yeah, that became a really important thing for us to try to get accomplished early in the window to say, okay, um, that's a difficult situation. What next? How do we how do we manage that? And really happy to see Josh and Mo. Uh, come in and again that's one where I say obviously we have a thought process about building but that doesn't mean the next 18 games don't matter they matter very much and that's why you see us going out and looking at these these loans to get us kind of to the to the summer and through the rest of the season 
Um, and I think both are very different players, but both have proven uh, a goal scoring ability at the level. And so really now it's just a matter of, okay, how quickly can uh, all these guys gel together and, and start having that new look squad uh, firing. And that's the important thing is because January is an incredibly difficult window. It is, and, yeah. and sometimes it's about on paper looking like you're coming out of it stronger. That's the main aim of it, coming out of it stronger. And on the balance of things, it looks as though the squad will be that for the remaining 18 games. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts in that squad gelling together. Um, and obviously, new new faces, they're, they're learning each other and they're learning how each other play and move. And that's a, that's a process, right? And it's just a process that has to happen fast because we have Saturday and Tuesday for the next three weeks or something like that, right? Um, and so, yeah, so I think there's a lot in that. Um, staying healthy, obviously managing the load uh, on the guys, uh, which uh, the technical staff, the training ground do a really good job of. Um, and, and those guys figuring out how to, how to play together. But yeah, overall, I, I think we were able to, to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish in January in light of Freddie going back, which was not something we wanted to have happen. But in that situation which we were faced with, I think we, we were able to accomplish what we had hoped to. Yeah. I think we rounded our January incoming business with the signing of Jamie Jellis from yep. Tamworth. And I think that's a transfer that I don't think has just caught the eye amongst Walsall fans. It seems to have caught the eye from a lot of people out outside of the club from Leeds and it, it seems like you know it's a real coup to secure his services so how pleased were you you know to get Jamie's addition over the line and how, how excited should fans be about you know seeing him on, on you know I think Matt Sadler said he's not too far away from being involved. Yeah he's coming along really well um, obviously he's had a bit of an injury issue but uh, looks like it may not be as, as bad as initially feared so I do believe we'll, we'll see him hopefully before too long. Uh, Jamie's a great player. I mean, very exciting prospect. Um, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him fight for a, a spot in the squad. He's got some tough competition in that midfield area right now. Um, but a really exciting signing and was, was really pleased uh, with, with Tamworth to be able to get that over the line. And then we've spoken about Harvey and Freddie going back to their parent clubs as well. Mm -hmm. But we also saw um, from ourselves Ronan Mayer, Rolly Meniese leave, going to Russell and uh, Aldershot respectively, and a marvellous Anabira Canlan was also let go. From an ownership point of view, what was the thought process behind allowing those guys to go? I think Matt has obviously said that they both needed game time, yep. um, and would that be the same thought process from yourselves as well? Yeah, and I guess I'd, I'd back up to a, a comment that applies even to the Walsall and the Drada situation is, um, we gotta look at what's best for the club, uh, in Walsall's case, what's best for the club in Drada's case, and what's best for players in their individual careers. Um, and those guys both needed games, uh, the ones that you mentioned, Rollin and Ronan. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, I was, was happy for them to be able to, to go to a place where they'll be able to get some more experience, get some game time in. Uh, and in the case of, of Ronan, obviously, who's uh, on contract with us next year, uh, hopefully he'll develop and, and have a really good loan spell at Rushall and kick on from there. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Ben. Uh, Warsaw fans, we hope that you've enjoyed the catch-up uh, with Ben. It's been an exclusive one that's talked us through uh, the January transfer window and the opening of the locker. As always, thank you very much for joining us here on the Warsaw Rewind for January. We hope you've enjoyed today's show. And if you have any comments, please leave them down in the comment section below for us.